Few things are quite as important to humanity's progress through the millennia as the ability to get places. Not just simply to populate the globe to the point of excess, but to build complex technological societies where we harness our understanding of the fabric of reality to make life both easier and theoretically better than it once was. Our lives nowadays are aided by technology in almost every single way. We can contact people on the other side of the world in less than a second, operate boxes with wheels on them to get to shops and pay for our shopping using magical plastic. Our houses are illuminated by light bulbs, food is cooked in ovens and reheated in microwaves or cooked in microwaves if you're in Weatherspoons. The internet gives us access to all things at all times. The treasure trove of endless knowledge is at our fingertips. And though we don't harness that power anywhere near enough, there's no denying the landscape of human life in the 21st century is dominated by the things, contraptions, inventions and machines our ancestors and their ancestors built. Things that once upon a time would have all been deemed impossible. No, incomprehensible. And we're still going. At the heart of that you have humanity, a species that harnessing science and persistence, possessing no shortage of power madness, has accomplished an impressive yet terrifying dominance over the world. One of the key aspects to this has been our ability to get everywhere. On planet Earth, precious few places are forbidden to us, and when at first it seems they are, if there is a way to make going there possible, we find it. A lot of that simply wouldn't be possible without the sensational machinery we have come up with. When you think about it, and I mean really think about it, it's bonkers. I mean, if you went back in time and told a caveman the future that awaited humanity, he'd probably be very confused, and then he'd have to smash a rock against your head and kill you. But you get the idea. Anyway, the point of this video isn't to gawk at the entire history of human transport, but it was a nice introduction. However, a revolution occurred within our history, an industrial revolution. One that changed not just our understanding about our capabilities as a species, but also our understanding about how things work. More specifically, how we can make things work. From the fires of this smoggy age arrived the steam locomotive. Upon its invention over 200 years ago, its might rapidly circled the earth. This method of transit was refined, defined and even more modernised, giving us the train in its many incarnations and railways to get between A and B in an unmistakably sooty style. So that brings us quite nicely to the focus of today's video. A steam locomotive famous all over the world. One that through chance has survived to this day and still runs over a century after its construction. Arguably the most famous locomotive on the planet. The Flying Scotsman. Disclaimer, before the hardcore rail enthusiasts start smashing the keyboards with their face, we are well aware that other locomotives do exist. Although, are they as known as this one? To you, maybe, but to the general observer, no. So, with that said, we'll crack on. The story of the Flying Scotsman begins in 1922, when the Great Northern Railway filed Engine Order 297 ordering the construction of 10 Class A1-462 Pacific locomotives 
to be constructed at Doncaster Works, according to designs by Nigel Gresley. Sir Herbert Nigel Gresley was one of Britain's most renowned mechanical engineers and designers, whose work often deemed both elegant in mechanics and aesthetics. The intended purpose of the A1s was to haul mainline express passenger trains. Following the Great Northern Railway's acquisition by the newly formed London and North Eastern Railway, following the amalgamation of 1923, in accordance with the Railway Act of 1921, which, following the First World War, the 120 smaller railway companies within Britain were mandated to reorganise it into the larger four companies known as the Big Four. The A1s cost roughly £8,000 each to build, with the one that would become known as the Flying Scotsman costing £7,944. Becoming the first new engine delivered by the London and North Eastern Railway, entering service on the 24th of February 1923. Carrying the Great Northern Railway number 1472 in absence of a London and North Eastern Railway numbering system at the time, the name Flying Scotsman would not be assigned to the engine until the following year of 1924. The name Flying Scotsman would originate from the service it hauled, the 10 o'clock London King's Cross to Edinburgh Waverley Express that had run since 1852, known often by the public as the Flying Scotsman. Upon its naming, it would be assigned a new LNER number, 4472, because a bigger number is always better. It would not take long for the Scotsman to become something of a flagship engine for the London and North Eastern Railway, representing the company at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley Park in both 1924 and 1925. At the time, the Scotsman represented the most powerful class of operating locomotives. Come 1928, the LNER made the decision to turn the Flying Scotsman into a non-stop service between London and Edinburgh, with five A1s selected to perform the task, including 4472 Flying Scotsman. Completing the 392 mile journey for the first time on the 1st of May in just over eight hours. For this purpose, the tender would be upgraded to fit a corridor so the crew could be changed without stopping the train. An idea Sir Nigel Gresley came up with in his sitting room. The Flying Scotsman would operate with corridor tender until 1936, when it was reverted to the original type and remained paired with an ordinary tender until its withdrawal from service in 1963. Well, at least the walls have gotten a clean now I've gone through. <laughs> On the 30th of November 1934, Flying Scotsman would make history, becoming the first steam locomotive to clock an officially authenticated record speed of 100 miles per hour, hauling a test train between Leeds and London. There have been many claims of railway companies having trains achieve 100 miles per hour, but none had officially been proven until this moment. For example, in 1904, Great Western Railway City of Truro supposedly made this feat but the record was deemed unreliable. Regardless, the Scotsman's certified accomplishment proved Steam's ability to provide high-speed rail services. Going forward, due to the success of more modern engines such as Gresley's own A4s, introduced in 1935, the Scotsman would see use to a significantly lesser extent, although it still worked mainline running passenger services. Up until the Second World War, all LNER passenger engines were painted apple green. But in 1943, alongside all railway stock during the war, the Flying Scotsman would be painted in black in light of the scarcity of paint. In 1946, Gresley's successor, an English railway engineer named Edward Thompson, would renumber the Scotsman to 103. Back in 1928, Gresley had begun modifying the A1 class of engines into an improved version known as A3, 
Flying Scotsman would be rebuilt into an A3 by the 4th of January 1947. Along with being repainted into its original apple green colour scheme, the 180 pounds per square inch boiler would be replaced with a 225 psi variant alongside being fitted with banjo shaped dome that it carries to this day and more efficient valves and cylinders. On the 1st of January 1948 Britain's railways would see nationalisation and the Flying Scotsman would be renumbered again holding the number E103 for a few months before all LNER locomotives would see their numbers increased by 60,000. 103 Flying Scotsman would henceforth be known as 60103 come December 1948. It would don the BR Express Blue livery between 1949 and 52, before being painted British Railways Brunswick Green, a colour it has sported on and off into modern times as its main livery. Come the 1960s, British Railways were phasing out steam, leading to rumours that the Flying Scotsman would become scrap. The A3 Preservation Society would attempt to raise sufficient funds to purchase the locomotive in order to prevent this. However, fundraising efforts fell short of the asking price of £3,000. Hope, however, was not lost as businessman and railway enthusiast named Alan Pegler, who had seen the Flying Scotsman as a child at the British Empire Exhibition, would step in and purchase it at a cost of £3,500. Flying Scotsman would run its last service with British Railways on the 14th of January 1963, driven by Jack Pexton, on the 1315 from London King's Cross to the Leeds service, though the locomotive would be changed at Doncaster, the town of its creation. This event garnered significant media interest, and at the end of its daily service career, the Flying Scotsman had covered over 2 million miles in just shy of 40 years. The Scotsman would immediately undergo restoration at Doncaster Works under Pegler, restoring it to its original LNER condition re-receiving the number 4472 and being painted apple green. The smoke deflectors would be removed and the standard tender would be replaced with a corridor tender. Pegler's contract with British Railways granted him the availability to run the Scotsman on the rail network until the 31st of December 1971. During this time, there was a brief steam ban on the main line meaning the Scotsman was the only steam locomotive which could operate the main line. On the 1st of May 1968, the Scotsman would complete a non-stop London to Edinburgh run in order to mark the 40th anniversary of the original non-stop Flying Scotsman service, with a follow-up non-stop return trip three days later. Following an overhaul later that year and into 1969, Prime Minister Harold Wilson's government would agree to support Pegler's intentions on running the Flying Scotsman in a tour of the United States and Canada, hauling a nine-coach train, provided it was used to promote British exports. In order to run in America, it had to be fitted with a cow catcher, a bell, buckeye couplers, a chime whistle, air brakes and a headlamp. Its journey began in Boston, Massachusetts in 1969, making a trip to Atlanta, Georgia via New York City and Washington DC. It would encounter strict anti-steam laws, of which the Scotsman fell short, being deemed a fire hazard, requiring it to be towed by a diesel or an electric locomotive for the legs of its journey. The Scotsman would not be allowed to carry any passengers and Pegler had to pay local railways to run their lines. The tour would be momentarily paused before resumption in 1970, with a run from Texas to Wisconsin, and then across to Montreal in Canada. From Montreal, the engine went to Toronto. In 1970, the British Prime Minister, Wilson, resigned. The next Prime Minister withdrew government backing off the project, leaving Pegler to fund it for the continuation on his own. 
Short of finances, Pegler saw a British week planned for San Francisco, and to recover his losses, planned to bring Flying Scotsman there. He embarked on a remarkably brutal run, only stopping for essentials. As a result, the engine was somewhat battered by the time it arrived. Upon its arrival in San Francisco, it was positioned for show at Fisherman's Wharf, but the train had to be quickly relocated to a far less accessible yard due to complaints from the stores it obstructed. As a result, the vast majority of its income was cut off. In 1972, the Scotsman would run trips on the San Francisco Belt Railroad to recover some of the losses, but Pegler was declared bankrupt by August 1972. The engine would be kept in storage at the US Army Sharp Depot in California to protect it from being seized by creditors. As for Pegler, he'd return home. Abandoned in the United States, at this point the Flying Scotsman's future was uncertain. But William McAlpine, a businessman with a private railway, would step in to save it. He agreed to pay the outstanding debts owed, purchasing Scotsman for $72,000 and ship the locomotive home via the Panama Canal. To hold the Scotsman in place, it would need to be welded on the deck of the ship. On its journey back over to the United Kingdom, the Scotsman was exposed to bad conditions, salt water and exposure. The Scotsman would reach Liverpool in February of 1973 travelling from Liverpool to Derby under its own steam before McAlpine paid for the restorations at Derby Works, beginning a 23-year period where it would be overhauled twice and run regularly. In October of 1988, Scotsman would leave the UK shores once more, venturing to Australia to participate in the Oz Steam 88 Festival. The event organisers would have preferred a visit from LNER A4-4468 Mallard, but due to the unavailability significant to that locomotive's history, maybe worth a future video, the Scotsman was sent in its stead. The Flying Scotsman would spend a year in Australia running 28,000 miles and would be reunited with its rival, Great Western Locomotive 4079 Pendennis Castle. McAlpine would list the Scotsman for sale in 1996 in light of his own financial struggles, at which point ownership would be passed to Tony Marchington, who held the engine until 2004 at which point Flying Scotsman would be purchased via auction by the National Railway Museum with a winning bid of £2.3 million. From 2006 until 2016, the Scotsman would undergo a 10-year long overhaul, finally returning to steam at the East Lancashire Railway in wartime black on the 7th of January 2016, where it completed several low-speed tests. In February of 2023, Scotsman celebrated its centenary and crashed, but it's fine, finalising this celebration at Shildon in County Durham, where the footage you are seeing has been filmed. As for Scotsman's future, who knows, maybe it'll continue running, or perhaps it may become a resident in one of the NRM's museums. What we do know is that this locomotive has had a hundred years of consistent spotlight. It has broken records in every direction. It hit a hundred miles per hour. It circumnavigated the globe and did the longest non-stop run for its time. The name carried prestige with every service it hauled. The culmination of these accomplishments are perhaps why it has earned the mantle of the world's most famous steam engine, drawing crowds of families and enthusiasts alike. 
Moreover, being the butt of the joke, as everyone's granddad has driven it at one point or another. So why is this engine special? Well, as you have already gathered, I am a train enthusiast. Not the type that stands at the end of platforms, but a volunteer who loves nothing more than getting a fire going in one of these beasts. I take enjoyment from seeing the locomotives running. I think that when an engine has a fire and steam, that it takes on its own personality. In a strange sense, with all different sights, smells and noises they produce. Something which I cannot relate to anything else. I've always enjoyed a good day out on my local steam railway, and the Flying Scotsman brings in people who maybe don't have the same fascination that I do, but come to appreciate it in its own right, as it is the centrepiece from the romantic age of steam, and shines a light on a hobby enjoyed by many. Of course, the Flying Scotsman is just a blip on a vast variety of engines which are special in their own right. From small shunting locomotives, to large locomotives like the 9F or Duchess class of the LMS. I remember starting my voluntary work and seeing the Flying Scotsman for the first time in wartime black while it was running in, which was quite a spectacle. And it's because of its fame it has become a household name, with many souvenirs available to purchase. It captures the imagination of everyone who looks at it. So there you have it, the history of the Flying Scotsman. I hope you have enjoyed today's video, and if you have, like, share and subscribe, remembering to hit that notification bell. If you have a friend that would like to enjoy our content, but keeps postponing their indulgence, then be sure to lock them inside the firebox of the Flying Scotsman, with nothing but an iPad with all our content on and threaten to ignite it with them inside unless they finish all of our videos. That will be all for today, see you in the next one.